Hello, everyone. This is Bethlehem Artfield. Welcome to the podcast Journey to Ethiopia with a story. The list of Ethiopia's sovereign rulers goes back to about 5,000 years. Today's story will take you to 17th century Ethiopia. Emperor Susnios ruled the country from 1606 to 1632. He was the 202nd ruler of Ethiopia from the House of Gondor and ruled the country for 26 years. This period in Ethiopian history is particularly important because it's a stage in early African history where Africans successfully resisted European influence. The king abandoned his state religion, which was Orthodox Christianity, and converted by Jesuits to Catholicism. This led to internal tensions and oppositions between the defender of the king and those who preferred the Orthodox faith. This is where the heroic noblewoman, Waleta Petros, comes into the picture. She led a successful nonviolent movement to preserve her nation's Orthodox Christian beliefs. The king finally abdicated and was replaced by his son, Facilides, who banned Catholicism and expelled the Portuguese and Spanish Jesuit missionaries. The life and struggle of our mother, Waleta Petros, tells the story of an Ethiopian saint written in Ge'ez language in 1672 by one of her followers, a young monk called Galaudius. It is the oldest African woman's biography written by an African in an African language. It was translated into English by Wendy Laura Belcher and Michael Kleiner and published by Princeton University Press in 2018. Today, I'll read an excerpt from this book. Who can make me abandon my love for Christ? Suffering, tribulation, exile, hunger, nakedness, the sword, anguish? As scripture says, because of you, Lord, they will kill us every day. We have become like sheep that will be slaughtered. I am confident, however, that nothing can make me abandon the love for God through Jesus Christ, neither death nor life, neither angels nor nobles, neither what is nor what will come, neither someone powerful nor anything above, nor the abyss, not even being born again in hell. There is nothing that can make me abandon the love of Christ. As for me, I'll always be faithful and will never renege. Nobody whosoever can persuade my heart that I should renounce my faith. Continuing on her way, our Holy Mother Waleta Petros then arrived at the king's castle. The king ordered all the great lords, nobles, learned men and the judges to assemble, and they did as the king had commanded. They all assembled richly adorned in great magnificence and sat down in circles according to their ranks and orders. Then the king commanded that they bring in our holy mother, Waleta Petros. She came and stood in front of them with a determined heart and a strong faith. She did not tremble due to their magnificence, the great number of their assembly or their empty talk. As David says in Psalms, Why are the Gentiles in uproar, and why do the people make empty talk? The kings of the earth have risen up, and the rulers have conspired with them against God and against the Anointed One. Waleta Petros, by contrast, stood alone, according to the procedure for a rebel against the king. Then those charged with speaking for the king, while he stayed in another room, said to her, You have rebelled against the king. You have rebelled against God. You have resisted his order. You have transgressed against his word. And you have blasphemed against his faith. You have subverted the heart of the people of the land so that they don't accept his faith and don't mention his name in the liturgy. However, 
our Holy Mother Wallata Petros did not respond or reply at all. Rather, she listened with her head bowed and a critical smile, but humbly said, I have not reviled the king. Rather, I'll never renounce my faith. On his part, the king regularly sent servants and inquire, What does she say? They told him she does not respond at all. Rather, she keeps silent and expresses amusement. Upon that, the king became enraged and said, She despises me, laughs at me and mocks me and ordered that she be killed or at least her breasts cut off. At that point, Walata Petros' husband, Melchia Christos, stood up before the king and said to him soothingly, My lord, do not lose your temper. It's not due to contempt for you that she is laughing, rather an evil spirit that has been residing in her since her childhood makes her laugh. With these words, Melchia Christos calms the king's rage. Truly, Melchia Christos still loved Waleta Petros very much. As for our holy mother, Waleta Petros, she did not fear death and was not terrified by the king's majesty. One of the translators of this book, Wendy Belcher, explains in the introduction of this book how she lived with her family in Gondor City, Ethiopia, when she was a little girl. She explains, I learned that the people of Highland Eritrea and Ethiopia, who call themselves the Abisha, are Christians and have been Christians for approximately 1700 years longer than most European people. Their church is called the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It's not Roman Catholic, Protestant or Eastern Orthodox. It is a special form of Christianity called non-Chalcedonian. And ancient churches in Egypt, Eritrea, Syria, Armenia and India share many beliefs with them. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church reveres saints, about 300 of whom are Abisha men and women who are specially holy leaders. Context of the book In the 1500s and early 1600s, Roman Catholic Jesuit missionaries traveled to Highland Ethiopia to urge the Abisha to convert from their ancient form of African Christianity to Roman Catholicism. The Jesuits ultimately failed, in part due to their cultural insensitivity. They did not blame themselves, however. They blamed their failure instead on the Abisha noblewomen. When I first read this accusation, I thought that it was simple misogyny. Sure, blame the women. But the more I read, the more I began to understand that one of the earliest European efforts to colonize Africa did indeed fail in part because of African women. Many Abisha men of the court converted for reasons of state, but their mothers, wives and daughters mostly did not. These women fought the Europeans with everything they had, from vigorous debate to outright murder, and after a decade, the Abisha men joined them. Together, they banished all Europeans from the country. Indeed, Ethiopia became one of the few countries never to be colonized by Europeans. The Biography of Walata Petros Walata Petros might seem to be unique. She was, after all, a literate 17th century African woman. She was an important leader, directing a successful non-violent movement against the Europeans. She founded her own monastery, over which she presided without any male authority over her. Her Ethiopian disciples wrote a book about her. Yet, closer examination reveals that Waleta Petros is not exceptional, but exemplary. That is, she's not a uniquely strong African woman, but an example of millions of strong ones. Evidence from multiple sources in multiple languages demonstrate 
that African women like Walete Petros were essential to the histories of their nations. After being raised in an adoring family, Walete Petros was married to a powerful man named Melchia Christos, one of the king's most important counselors and military commanders. He decided to convert to Roman Catholicism along with the king and other noblemen, but Walete Petros was against this filthy faith of the foreigners, as the text puts it. She decided to leave her husband and take up the life of a nun around the age of 23, in part because all three of her children had died in infancy, leaving married life without its fruits. Her husband threatened to destroy an entire town to retrieve her, so Waleta Petros returned to her husband to save the town's people from death. However, when she learned that her husband had participated in killing the head of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, she withdrew from him in disgust, abandoning all forms of adornment and eating. Finally, her husband allowed her to leave him and fulfill her dream of becoming a nun. Within a few days, Waleta Petros met another noble woman who has become a nun and also resisting Roman Catholic conversion. This fellow nun, Eta Christos, meaning Sister of Christ, became Waleta Petros' lifelong partner and companion. Waleta Petros then began her life as a radical, itinerant preacher. She publicly rebuked all those who had converted, including the king, his court, and the clergy. She became an enemy of the state and regularly had to flee persecution with such high-ranking figures as the king's brother and second in command, Silla Christos, hunting her down. Enraged by her behavior, the king ordered that she appear before the entire court. All its princes, governors, officials and scholars, a sign of what a threat she was considered. She was so fearless there that her husband had to beg the king to spare her life, which he did. Walata Petros' fame skyrocketed after her confrontation with the king, and many of the Abisha faithful came long distances to join her emphatically orthodox and therefore decidedly anti-Catholic religious community. As revolutionaries, Walata Petros' followers had to move constantly to new towns and regions to stay ahead of the king's spies and the European soldiers who wanted to kill them. Soon, Waleta Petros was hauled before the court again, but her husband again saved her life by suggesting that the king subject her to thought reform. The king agreed, and a theme of Roman Catholic priests spent every Saturday with her, working to convert her to Roman Catholicism. They were not successful. Every week the king would ask the European head of Roman Catholics whether he had succeeded, and every week he had to report that he had not. Walata Petros resisted one of the most persuasive educational institutes ever invented. When all these efforts failed, the king made up his mind to kill her. But yet again, her husband saved her life by suggesting another compromise, exile. So the king banished her to a place on the edge of their known world, where she was kept in chains among the pagans. Her jailer tried to seduce and then kill her, but she decided not to succumb, but instead survived. Eventually, struck by the force of her convictions, he became a devotee. By special dispensations, the king allowed her to return then, after three years in the wilderness, along with all those who had followed her there. When Waleta Petros returned to Highland Ethiopia, she established her religious community in and around Lake Tana, a huge lake with many monasteries. She was the head of her community, there was no abbot in charge over her. 
Unsurprisingly, she encountered strong resistance from male leaders who challenged her authority and asked where in the Bible it said that a woman could lead and preach. A famous monk and scholar defended her, however, saying that God raised up a woman to defend the Ethiopian Orthodox Church because many priests have abandoned it. Not long after, in 1632, the king rescinded his edict, making Roman Catholicism the state religion, and the country returned to the beliefs of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Weleta Petros was elevated by her people as a heroine who had helped enable the return of the true church. She spent the remaining 12 years of her life traveling and setting up religious communities in new towns. The events of this latter part of her life take up more than half of the book. She performed many miracles and saved her community from repeated threats sometimes with drastic measures. But her reputation kept growing. She died after an unknown illness that lasted several months, having lived 26 years as a nun. After her death, her community set up a monastery devoted to her at Korasta, on the eastern shore of Lectana. There, Eta Christos became the abbess of Waleta Petros' monastery until her own death. That monastery still exists today. The writing of this book. Thirty years after Waleta Petros died, the young monk Galavdios wrote a beautiful book about her life, based on the community's oral histories. Many of the stories told about Waleta Petros are told by women, so this book is not just about an African woman, but is written in part by African women. This book is a, in a genre called hagiography, or sense life. About 100 Abisha saints have had hagiographies written about them. Only five of those books, including this one, have been translated into English, and the other four translations are difficult to access. Meanwhile, only one translation into English of the hagiography of any black female saint, the 17th century West African Spanish saint Teresa Chicaba, has been published, and it was written by Europeans, not Africans. Our translation represents the first accessible translation into English of an early modern African woman's life. Thank you for listening. Please read the discussion points under the description of this episode. We would like to hear your views on these points and any other observation you may have. If you'd like to listen to more stories as soon as they are released, please subscribe to this channel. Until the next story, goodbye.